Hello and welcome to the F-Rated podcast. I'm Holly Tarquini, the founder of the F-Rating. And I'm broadcaster and journalist Anu Anam. Welcome to episode four of the F-Rated podcast. And by now, you know what the F-Rating is. The F is for feminist and it is an intersectional feminist rating for films. Holly, actually, one thing we didn't talk about, and I'm curious about this, is can people look for like a list of F-rated films? Like, how do you know if a film is or isn't F-rated? Where would you find the collection? That is a very good question. One answer is that there are now over 100 cinemas and film festivals in the UK who F-rate their programme. You can find them on the F-rated website under we f rate but you can also find f rated as a keyword on imdb so if you go into imdb and you search f hyphen rated and then click keywords you'll get it's now up to nearly twenty six thousand titles which are f rated wow. and you can yourself f rate films so any film which is directed and or written by a woman is F rated. If there are multiple directors or multiple writers, they have to be 50%. And if the work, if the film is directed and written and stars women, it's triple F rated. Right. And if you've missed any of that, or you just want to check out the website, just go to f-rated.org. And today, Holly, we get to the first of our directors. This is really, really exciting. It's really exciting. Sarah Gavron, who we're going to hear from, is one of the best British female directors. And she's really unusual in that she's made four feature films. So most female directors make one feature film if they're lucky. They have to represent all women and be utterly brilliant from the get go. Uh, Yeah. So here's the interview. Today, we're speaking to a truly innovative director, Sarah Gavron. Sarah's films include Suffragette, which stars Kerry Mulligan, Helena Bonham Carter, and Meryl Streep, and the 2019 film Rocks, which pushed so many boundaries. For a start, it had a 75% female crew. It was basically filmmaking with very little hierarchy, filmmaking by reverse mentoring. We'll get Sarah to explain all of this. Yeah, welcome, Sarah. It's an absolute joy to have you here today. And thank you for coming and joining us on the F-Rated podcast. Thank you for having me. Sarah, let's start a little bit with your journey. Um, When you were younger, whatever point that you decided to become a filmmaker, were there many role models in terms of female directors? No. (laughs) So, uh, no, when I started out, I mean, one thing was I wasn't aware of women film directors. I mean, there were, they did exist. And once I started to discover them, I found wonderful people like Sally Potter and Gorinda Chadha was doing some of her early work and Mira Nair and Jane Campion's early work. So they did exist, but there just weren't very many of them and they weren't very visible to me. Um, So it didn't even occur to me that it was possible for me as a woman to be a director. It just didn't occur to me. Um, And so it took a while to find my way into the world. You grew up in London and um, your your mum was in local politics. Um, How much of that background feeds into what you do? Well, oddly, I think sort of quite a lot because I watched her go. She she was working at a local community centre, which I hung out in a lot. And um, and it was, you know, when I was sort of naught to ten, it was the 70s and then the early 80s. And they had a very kind of egalitarian approach in that community centre. And there was no hierarchy and they were getting things off the ground and they were evolving. And I was sitting in these smoke filled rooms listening to groups of people try to work out how to make a youth club and how to do a magazine and how to get involved with the local community. And I was just sitting watching and I became a real observer, I think. of um, And I was the youngest of four. And so I was always watching life and no one particularly wanted to listen to me. And I think that was kind of a good training. Um, for film in a way and then I watched her gain agency as she went into local politics and in a very male world and the way she kind of navigated that Um, but there was no kind of film references but I became very interested in drama at school as a sort of way of expressing myself in some ways and art and politics Um, and there was obviously this political dialogue going on at home so I felt it was important to to work on things that had impact, uh, how, however you interpret that. So that was, I can see now that that was all feeding into my journey. And was she a feminist, Sarah? Was she, was, was the organisation, it sounds as though it was, 
maybe more kind of socialist what she was trying to achieve and the way she was trying to achieve it. But was she also within feminism? I think she was. I mean, at, you know, from the age of 10 onwards, she was a single mother. She was sort of pioneering. She was speaking out. She was surrounded by a lot of um, interesting women who were supporting her and, you know, they were in groups. So, yeah, I'd say she definitely would have conceived of herself as a feminist. So, Sarah, how and why directing? How did you get there? And, and why did you want to do it? So it you know, it wasn't like I knew, you know, I often read about filmmakers who went to the local art house cinema age sort of 14 and fell in love with Truffaut or whoever it was or Bergman. And I didn't have any of those references. I was going to my local video shop and watching, uh, you know, age 14, Dirty Dancing till the tape ran out, you know. So I really, really wasn't watching high art or, or sort of having that as a place to go. But I was also directing in my own home I, my sister and I were kind of joined at the hip and we were playing all these games and I was directing her constantly I realize now but we weren't capturing it we didn't have a super eight camera we didn't have a video camera or anything um and then so but then I, I did an English degree and I suddenly became aware of documentaries and I thought maybe that was what I wanted to do because you could you know, I thought, oh, well, they've got a message and they can change things. And, and so I became um, a runner and then a researcher for a documentary company. And through that started then um, doing some assistant directing and little bits of directing um, in very isolated way for the BBC and um, some for Channel 4 I was researching. And so I saw the documentary world. And through that, I began to realise that I was having these fantasies. And it was literally just a sort of gut impulse about stories I wanted to tell. And they weren't stories I wanted to write. They were stories I wanted to see. And I'd sit on the bus and I'd kind of imagine all the images. And I thought, OK, this is fiction. But I didn't dare. Uh, I would had done a course at the at Edinburgh College of Art with some really interesting filmmakers um, who introduced me to kind of classy people, uh, classy filmmakers, Tarkovsky, you know, I'd never heard of. And, and, and so I began to think, OK, fiction is what I want to do. And I applied, I made some short films in my own kind of home. And then I applied to the National Film and Television School to do fiction. And that totally opened up my eyes to how to direct fiction. What was it like there at the time? And was it so at the moment, I know that film school spits out 50 50 male and female. Was that the case when you were there? Well, previous to me, there hadn't been a lot of women on the directing course. They take five each year. But my year, um, we were three women, a Latvian woman, a Korean woman and me and two men. Um, so that was a really, really unusual year. And that was exciting to be with those women and also to be with those women from different cultures who thought about the world in different ways. So I definitely didn't feel I was in a minority there. Um, on the cinematography course, there was only one woman. So, you know, still in uh, behind the scenes wasn't equal. It was a great nurturing environment. I mean, it was tough and we were sort of hard on ourselves and judgmental and, you know, all those things that happen at film school. But what was brilliant about it was, it was three years. It was paid for in those days. It was an environment where you had great mentors. You, you know, you had a structure. You could make films and you could try things out. So... For me, it was just what I needed. I was 27 to 30. I'd kind of had a bit of life experience. I had stories I wanted to tell. And it was a great moment for me to explore them. I think your graduation film kind of won awards and became your calling card. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I definitely didn't have that thing of sort of age 22. I made a short film that everybody loved and then I, the doors opened. They didn't open at all. And all through my 20s, right up to that graduation film, I felt like I was trying very hard to break into a world that didn't necessarily feel I should be there. And, you know, I'd write off to agents or I'd send things off to festivals and I, I was getting a lot of rejection. So the graduation film was called Losing Touch and it was written by a really brilliant Australian female um, screenwriter called Antonia Baldo, who was at the film school. And um, it was shot by a cinematographer who's become my husband. So we worked together on that shoot. Um, and it was a story of a little girl and her family. They were an immigrant family living in the countryside and the father left and it was the way that the girl responded to that and her family, her wider family, her grandparents were there responding. They were all outsiders. And um, I felt that even though it wasn't my, you know, Antonia was had Italian background and I had um, Eastern European Jewish background, but somehow there was a connection between us about um, that story in the multi-generational family and 
the broken family. And so it felt like a really good vehicle for me to explore some ideas visually, dramatically and creatively. I mean, I still had a lot to learn and it was still kind of, I was early in my journey, I can now see, but it, 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 it sort of came together, it coalesced in a way that some of the other films hadn't. But with that final film, for whatever reason, it just worked more effectively um, than any of the other shorts I'd made. And I think maybe I just sort of found my feet and it went off to a film festival called Telluride, which was extraordinary. And I met these other filmmakers. It went to the London Film Festival, you know. And so suddenly I was in this environment of festivals, which, you know, you're surrounded by filmmakers and people who speak the same language and you exchange ideas. And I was so excited by that. I was like, this is just, you know, this is about creating and this is exciting. I mean, there still weren't a lot of women, but in the short film world, there were many more women. So let's talk about your second film, Suffragette which follows this woman who works in a laundry in East London, Maud. She's about 24 years old. And she's part of this world where women are exploited, underpaid. Uh, there's real drudgery there. And this is at the time when uh, women are also campaigning to get the vote, and they have been for a long time. And, and so she gets drawn into that reluctantly at first, and then she becomes a, a really passionate member of that movement at great personal cost. Um, tell me about your role in making that film happen. I mean, is it something you'd wanted to do or did you just sort of get drawn into an existing project? No, it wasn't an existing project. So I'd wanted to do a film about the suffragettes for ages. And when I came out of film school, I was sort of talking to people about it. And I think, you know, at that point, there just wasn't the appetite for a film about the suffragettes. I mean, it makes you realise the world has changed in terms of commissioners, because you say to the people, I want to make a film about women and politics, and they go, women and politics? Oh. You know, and then you'd say, well, there are cars there are carriage chases and they explode things and they go mm, you know but so it wasn't it wasn't a receptive world and there weren't many women directors making that kind of film and so um and also perhaps I wasn't at the right point I hadn't done enough um so then I you know I went away and made a couple of other films and by the time I got to that point we were sort of seeing what then we were talking about as the fourth wave of feminism and you know it now seems sort of kind of dated to talk about it but the internet was changing things you were hearing from women during the Arab Spring you were hearing you know it felt like women were much more vocal and people were waking up and suddenly even Cameron was wearing a I'm a feminist t-shirt you know the it, it was a, there was a shift a hundred percent there was a shift and suddenly we went into picture and people were really receptive it felt like we caught this way at the beginning of a wave anyway um, and now that's changed again but um, and that made it much easier. And then and then a cast were attracted to it and it became, you know, a film of some scale. But I was fascinated and worked with Abby Morgan about the idea of telling the story of the because we went into the women's library and we discovered all these diaries that, you know, where Emily Wilding Davison had written a diary of being in prison and underlined certain words and put exclamation marks. And it felt so real and so of now, actually. Uh, you know, it was relating to all sorts of protests that were happening around the world and the way people protest and the, the idea of not having a voice. And so I was really, really excited about telling that and also telling the story of the working women rather than the upper class women. And it, you know, we know that it was a you know, a, a movement that embraced quite a lot of classes. Uh, but we wanted to tell the story of the working women. So that's why we focused on Maud, who was a kind of amalgam of a character. Just to insert, you said Emily Davison. Now, she was one of the real life suffragettes that's depicted in the film. And, and the climax involves an incident in which she basically ran onto a racetrack in front of King George in front of the world's cameras to get their uh, movement in front of the planet and, and to influence public opinion. Yeah, we have discussions in my house. I've got two teenage daughters about whether it was on purpose or accidental. There's the I whole know. I mean, discussion, it, which you bring out in the film, yeah, isn't it's there? Yeah, it's a really interesting discussion, that. Um, but, you know, she they knew what they were doing in terms of manipulating the press. So the fact that the point at which she ran out, whether or not she expected to survive it, is another question. But I think she was... At that point, they were all, not all of them, but a group of them were so willing to sacrifice themselves for this cause because they got, you know, the, the hunger striking and the force feeding, they were risking their lives. Um, but she, I thought it was extraordinary that the position she ran out on was in line with the cameras. So they caught that moment. To me, it looks as though your 
career has followed the progression of feminism of that suffragette being a kind of moment of oh my god yes there are all these women's stories to tell on why haven't we been telling them and then i suspect and here comes my question that um that you faced quite a lot of attacks of suffragette because whenever we publicly do feminism we do it wrong and there are lots yeah. of other feminists who are very passionate very well informed people that will tell us exactly what we've missed what we haven't done and what we haven't achieved did you face a lot of that yeah no i definitely did and it's really interesting because the landscape is shifting all the time you know and if i was to work on suffragette now i'd do it in a very different way and i think it would be really interesting to well one there was the issue of race and i think you know that was that was so complex uh, at the time because obviously the american movement had incredible people of color involved in it and the british movement less so although there was sophia dulip singh who the princess sophia dulip singh was an incredible advocate of well she was a member of, of the suffragette movement and you know you'd look at that again i think well i certainly would um and I think, you know, the world would want you to and it'd be for the right reasons and cast it in a different way. And, you know, it would tell a different story. So I think, you know, you're you're always making a film in a context, aren't you? And responding to the context and then challenging yourself. And, and what's so interesting about film is you're in constant dialogue with your audience and you then usually too late learn learn interesting lessons uh, you know uh, once you've made something and then your next film is a response to that in lots of ways and and it's about yeah it's about the personal evolution but it's also about the world's evolutions but yeah I think if as a woman filmmaker or any filmmaker who puts his head above the parapet you have to be prepared to um, then engage in that dialogue and know that it's not all going to be easy and actually on every film I've made um, my daughter often says to me, why do you just pick these subjects? You know, <laughs> on every film I make, there is a complicated and difficult and challenging discussion and they're just not easy. And, you know, and I could make a, a film, you know, with Judy Dench in a studio in Elm Street with a monologue and life would be easier, but I haven't chosen that path. <laughs> but also that's what I really like. And I, and I love that what it looks as though suffragette and all of those issues and discussions came to was rocks. Yeah, I think that's true in, so, in lots of ways. I mean, you know, I'd sort of been circling a lot of the rocks ideas for many years and wanting to do something around young people and uh, that was sort of local and that but you, you kind of hybrid documentary and fiction and used a lot of those techniques. But yes, I think going and talking to people about suffragette and you know we met a lot of young people young audiences and they were saying what's life like well we were asking them or they were talking about what life like was like for them growing up now and how things have changed over 100 years and I was sitting with a whole eclectic range of young women from all over the you know because you go to festivals and you meet those people and that made me fascinated by why don't we do a film that captures now for women. Rocks stars young girls from East London these girls had never acted professionally before. And the story itself is a collaboration really between those girls that star in the film, the writers, uh, you, the producers, it's extraordinary. Um, and it's basically centered around a black British teenage girl living in Hackney. Her mum disappears, abandons them, and she then has to kind of deal with her, her life and her little brother. And uh, yeah, it's fab it's fabulous. I hate the word diversity because, you know, diversity assumes that the world is white and everyone else kind of fits in. This to me was just so real. The characters were of all kinds and they were, they were wonderful. So tell us about Rocks. How did that come about? Yeah, so, you know, it, so it came out of this desire to look at what, what it's like to be a, a young woman now. And I, I had, I've got a teenage daughter and she was exactly at that point. Um, and she goes to the local school and, and we live in a place where all the school children walk down our street every morning. So I was seeing, and there's a girls' school, so I was seeing crowds of, of girls you know, chatting and being really lively and laughing and shouting. And you thought, where are those girls on our screen? Screens. Are. And, you know, when we grew up, or at least when I grew up, I didn't see many films that centred the story of young women. And, but, but by the time I got to the point of making this film, obviously I was a million miles away from these girls in, in, in every respect. So 
And I've always been interested in collaboration. That's what I love about film, that, you know, it's more than some of its parts, that you get together with people that you can't anticipate what they're going to contribute and you build it as a group. And and so we, we right from the outset, I talked to Faye Ward, who was the producer at Fable, who I'd worked with on Suffragette, and said, let's build it with these young people and let's get a young creative team of women and everybody's in from the right from the outset. So rather than us conceive an idea and say, let's do a script about and then go out and find the cast and crew it up in the normal way where you develop in isolation, just you and the writer for months or years, let's actually find the cast first and respond to them. And so first it, it evolved, it was constantly evolving. So first Lucy Pardee, who is the casting director, um, who's worked a lot in terms of street casting and does research and and me went into schools in east london and we sat there and we sat at the back of the lessons and we were just really open we just said let's see what's going on let's not have any ideas about what we're going to see let's just listen to these young people and then we met them in their breaks and chatted to them and then we invited them to workshops and meanwhile we met up with Teresa okoko who's um, British Nigerian hackney born writer who'd done some brilliant plays and was just moving into screenwriting and Claire Wilson and we got in a room together and we said what could this be and we thought let's workshop so we just ran this series of workshops with this series of young people talking to them playing games having discussions doing improvisations and then we'd kind of reconvene and go what what do we think and what was so important to all these young people was female friendship and, you know, and a lot of the tropes of teenage films, like they hinge around boys or they hinge around the first sexual experience, or weren't going on for these young people at that moment. You know, it was all about their female friendships. And so we wanted to, we thought, let's capture that. Let's tell that story. And then we, we you know, as happens with filmmaking, is you often find a point where you've got millions of brilliant ideas, but you need something to string it together. And we weren't quite finding that narrative thread. So in the evolution, after about six months of workshopping, where we had brilliant characters and ideas and scenes and context, we didn't have a story. And Teresa Okoko came in one day and said, um, I've got this story I've been working on separately that's kind of connected with her upbringing. And she said, how about that as a narrative thread? And she sort of just spoke it out to uh, to me and Claire and and um, one of the script editors in a room and said so it would have start off with this and then the boy and everything that we wanted could feed into it so we could still have our brilliant dance class with that girl we'd met who was an Afrobeats expert we could still have that character it was Kosar you know who played Samaya who was Somali and we could we fed all those moments in and and then they built this kind of bible that then became a proper script which we worked off but the young people themselves had sort of fed into it and they pitched it back to the young people who then said, how about this and how about that? And it was it was a real dialogue. And the whole thing was constructed like almost like forum theatre where there was a constant dialogue. Would this work? Is this right? What does everybody think? You know, and, and so that was the kind of flattened hierarchy where I wasn't lee I wasn't at the top. I was saying, OK, I'm, I'm with you guys. Let's all do this together. Let's work this out. I can bring my experience. You can bring your experience. So that was great. That whole process sounds incredibly creative and inspiring and brilliant. And I can imagine then getting to the shoot and saying, right, now you've all just got to be quiet and do what I tell you to do, because otherwise we're just not going to get to the end of the day and get enough in the can. How did you manage that? Well, we constructed the shoot in a way. So I spoke to, I was sort of learning from people who had paved the way for this kind of filmmaking in the past and look, watching how they were, had worked. So, you know, I learned the film chronologically because then these these people who are first time actors can hold on to the story and you as a creative team can keep adjusting and watching and responding to what's happening. We filmed only in real locations, no set builds. And we filmed geographically in the place that the film story was set so that nobody was having to imagine that this was the world. It was the world and that all our supporting artists were taken from that world. We crewed up, crucially, we crewed up so that you didn't have that kind of incredible disconnect where you look behind the camera and see lots of oldish white men who are slightly intimidating and know their job better than you do. And, you know, because they've been there for millions of years and you're sort of feeling like, ah, I feel like a fish out of water with you. And they're filming 
a story about young girls. That didn't feel right. It was like, why don't we grow up in a way where everybody's a storyteller anyway they are. You know, the costume designer is contributing to the storytelling. The makeup person is. The DOP certainly is. They all are in their own ways. Why don't we crew up with people who connect with this? Uh, so women, wherever possible, entire um, camera teams of women. And, you know, they're very close to the actors. It's a very intimate relationship. And where possible, women who look like and come from backgrounds close to the kids. And even the area of London, you know, where possible. So, so we tried to make it cohere as a piece so that it felt right and felt sort of, you know, all of one. So by the time we got to the shoot... They were quite practised and they knew people. It was still chaos, absolute <laughs> chaos. And I, I've never done a shoot because didn't, I didn't want them to be quiet. So, um, you know, and it wasn't right that they should be quiet. So they'd roll in. We'd already roll in the cameras. The cameras were rolling all the time. At one point I thought, do I need it? I actually, you know, my voice is hoarse. I mean, I'm shouting all the time. I'm like, come over here, we're starting now. Do you remember what the scene is? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like the normal pin drop set. It was just that life and chaos that we were trying to capture. And we were going with it wherever possible. I'm really curious, Sarah, about what you witnessed in terms of the, the blossoming of these gorgeous young women. You know, this movie to me is like the anti-clueless, you know, when I was growing up, like that's what you saw on screen. And with all the makeup in the world, I'm never going to look like that. You know, yeah. this was so beautiful to see these non-airbrushed real girls being themselves, to hear them, to hear their thoughts, to watch how they express their joy and their fear. And I just wonder if you if you could give me a little bit of that, like how how did you see them grow into themselves? You know, the process of making this film. They really did grow in incredible ways, and I could never have anticipated. I mean, I think part of that journey they would have gone on anyway because they were, we were watching them grow up. So when we met Bookie, she was fourteen. She was in a classroom. She was she'd say she was belligerent. She was naughty. You know, the first three times I saw her in a drama class, she'd walk in and the teacher would say, "Okay, go straight to isolation because you're late," and she'd just <laughs> throw down her bag and go straight to us. You know, um, I mean, she was she, she's your lead actress. She's the lead she's the actress. One who plays yeah. Uh, rocks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then she came to the first few workshops and she was sort of reluctant and didn't say much and you know and if you'd done a normal casting process after two times of seeing her you would have said you know she's not right but she was then she came back to the third and fourth and fifth workshop and I'd say by about the fifth workshop there was an improvisation and suddenly she started to do really interesting work and then she said she wanted to come back you know and she suddenly threw herself into it and she discovered that she liked acting and that came from her and then she really became committed to it and started reading about filmmaking and watching Moonlight and films by black filmmakers and referencing Viola Davis when we talked and, you know, really, really became absorbed in the world of it and, and transformed. I wouldn't say we were responsible for that. I'd say that came from her. And, you know, they all had this tenacity and this boldness and this curiosity. And I suppose all we were doing was providing a space where they could show us who they were and often school is by necessity so restrictive that you don't get to explore those ideas and you know but but now Bookie's sort of exceeded any of my but I mean she is just so extraordinary she's wise you know when I did a Radio 4 interview she sort of rang me up before and went you'll be okay Sarah I know you're nervous but you'll be all right you know she's oh. now my my kind of parent she's just she's just you know she's amazing and she's motivated and she's stable and all those things that are really hard to be in this business and she's got it all what i found really upsetting about the film was thinking these girls are all fantastic and where do they have that opportunity to be that fantastic I also wonder, Sarah, about, you know, everyone on that project must have had a huge learning curve, um, not just with filmmaking, but in being real allies and in confronting, you know, we all have personal biases. I mean, I was watching the film thinking, I've lived in Hackney. I love how ethnically diverse it is, but I would probably walk past a group of girls like that going, oh, you know, troublemakers, you know, we, we just, mm. we respond mm. to things in ways. And I loved that about the film that it made me stop and go, oh gosh, look, there's so much more to this group of girls that I would never have seen. So, so I wonder what sort of, you know, personal unconscious biases or what sort of things happened on set that made you all grow in your own mm. understanding of each other. 
I get, I always say, and I think it's really true that I was the one who learned the most, you know, um, because a lot of the team, well, someone like Teresa Rococo lives and breathes that world, you know, and she'd done a lot of youth work and work with gangs and young people. So she knew those girls from the inside. She knew their potential and what they were capable of. Um, and then, you know, I also worked with an associate director, Anu Henriquez, who also knew young people um, in that way. So for me, it was a revelation, undoubtedly. I was like, wow, I've, you know, as you say, these girls are capable of anything and they've got so much to teach us and they've got so much potential. And, and they're so engaged and they're so politically engaged as well. That's another thing that I, you know, thought was so impressive. And they're defining themselves and their identities and challenging the world in such interesting ways. And, um, you know, during lockdown, when our film got delayed, uh, we had we ran a little film club um, on Zoom for the girls in the cast because suddenly their worlds had dropped away like everybody's worlds, but they didn't have school and they didn't have the film to hold on to and what was happening. And they were coming up with ideas for the film club and then Black Lives Matter happened and Bookie and Kosar set up a website, an educational website, so people could go to resources about race and, and, and you just thought, well, that's brilliant. You know, they become activists and, and so... It's, they they have this potential. So I was constantly learning. They were challenging my preconceptions all the time. I mean, literally all the time. I've never been so challenged. So now I feel like I've gone through a university of life, you know, in the last four years from these young people. And so what's next? The, the real issue with me is that I have to set myself a challenge. So I just can't go, OK, I've learned how to do that. I'll do it again. It just doesn't seem to be the way my mind works. So I'm constantly going, how about I try something I've never done before? <laughs> and um, so I make my life really difficult. But anyway, I'm exploring right now a number of different projects and, you know, really digging into things and trying to work out where to go next what it feels like would be interesting to do now. And I think we're at an interesting time with film, certainly independent film, because I think you really have to justify why something is a film and who it's going to reach and how you're going to make it in a way that, you know, has power and justifies the process and all those things. So it's got an extra added challenge to it these days, I think. But Sarah, I also wonder, I mean, not just where you go from here, but also having nurtured these amazing kids who may or may not have gone into acting or gone into film. I mean, the, there's, you know, the the child, the little boy, D'Angelo, who plays uh, Rox's little brother. Manuel, oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, wisdom and cuteness and, you know, humor and I mean, just everything rolled into to one. Where did those guys go from? Because you've created this amazing opportunity, but is the industry kind of now ready to give them the sorts of opportunities, mm. you know, that they deserve? I mean, is little D'Angelo going to get the same opportunities as the Daniel Radcliffe's and the Macaulay Culkins? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And what I really impressively, not me, but the a lot of the members of the team have done is set up an organization which I, you know I'm cheering from the sidelines but they're leading completely called Bridge and the notion of it is that they provide a space for an ongoing relationship with the young people from the film and not just the key players but also the supporting artists and they say if they want to go into the industry you know, whether or not they want to be a production designer or they want to be a script writer or they want to be an actor, or even if they, you know, not sure what they want to do, that team of people can draw on their contacts. So there's, you know, the casting directors there, the casting associate, the two writers are in it, lots of, lots of the team are in it. And they're running workshops for those young people ongoing. They're, ha they're mentoring them. They're, I think mentoring is such a crucial thing, really, isn't it? So anyway, they're trying to create structures that the film industry doesn't currently have. You know, often we pick up new people, new talent, and then we drop them. And, you know, they don't know how to sustain it. And it's not a very, traditionally, hasn't been a very welcoming, easy industry to navigate. It hasn't been very open to people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, from different ethnicities. There's no role models. There's no obvious routes. People don't know how to put in applications and play the game and don't have contacts. And, you know, my the main question I answer when I go to um, talks is how do you get into it no one knows you know it's not obvious you don't put in an application form so um 
I think that the, we need to look at that because we'll have a richer industry, a broader audience, more interesting stories. We'll all learn more if we if we become more accessible. Yeah, and it is that challenge, isn't it? Because it is still an industry of who you know. Yeah, no, so I was at the school in Tottenham doing a talk and two girls who were interviewing us who were just recently graduated from school were saying, is it all right that we ask for your emails or is that sort of odd? And, you know, I was like, no, no, of course you you need to network. That's that's important, you know. So that is important, that kind of... Uh, but But we need more obvious transparent structures for people to be able to access nobody from eton would ask that question no. they would know perfectly well that they can ask for your email that that's what they have to do and they would give you their card at the same time <laughs> and it is yeah. how you share that yes you have the authority to make films your voice is important you should be telling your story and you know you are as valid, as important, as significant as Boys from Eton. That, totally, that totally. kind of challenge. And that's what I think was so thrilling for a lot of the girls in Rocks, that what I realised is when they were sitting in the cinema watching it, they weren't watching the screen, they were watching other people watching them, thinking they're interested in our story. That's exciting. Sarah, is there anything that you, if you were travelling back through time, <laughs> that you would advise your younger self or you'd want to say to your younger self as you were starting out? Oh, so many things. I mean, I, you know, one of my regrets is you can't live like five lives. I, every time I've not taken an opportunity, I've kind of regretted it. It's important to kind of grab life by the horns. Uh, and yeah, you learn, don't you? I mean, maybe you couldn't go back and change things. But when I'm um, giving advice to younger filmmakers or newer filmmakers, I think it is partly that confidence. It is really being true to yourself and not being, you know, going, who am I and what do I really believe and what do I really want to tell? And then trusting that that will be interesting to people um, rather than trying to imitate or please or fit in or, you know, all those things. And uh, being kind to people you work with really important i think we we need to really value that and understanding how to motivate people and understanding that kindness and support is a much better way of motivating than other ways that have traditionally been used in filmmaking um so i i try to sort of spread that message i mean it's very difficult you're under lots of pressure there's lots of reasons to uh, you know be bad tempered and not behave well but there's no excuse for it i don't think I love that final message, Sarah, a kindness, because even if, you know, someone looks like you, if they just don't give you the time of day, it's not very helpful, is it? Um, no. Thank you so, so much for giving up your time on a very busy day to speak to us. It's been utterly fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was brilliant. Well, thank you both. Great to talk to you. Great to talk to you. Holly, I loved what she said in there about a film about women and politics? You must be joking. That was that was one of the most uh, memorable lines. But just to share that um, the, the organization that Sarah was just talking about, Bridge, um, they have a website. So if you wanted to look it up, um, it's wearebridgeuk, that's all one word, dot com, wearebridgeuk.com. And the other lovely thing, Bookie from Rocks, has gone on to do really, really well. She's now starring in The Strays on Netflix. Do you know about this? I didn't know she was in it, but I know about The Strays and The Strays is huge. So that is such great news. I love her so much in Rocks. Um, yeah, that's great. And next time, of course, we're talking to screenwriter Gabby Chappie. And Gabby is one of those grafting writers who has been writing for every series that we know and love forever and is now doing magnificent work on screen. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. And please, just please remember that we want this podcast to amplify these women's voices and careers. We want it to lead to more opportunities for women intersectional feminists for all kinds of people to be included in the storytelling that you see on screen so all we're asking you to do is simply hit the like button it tells apple it tells spotify whatever podcast platform you're on that you're enjoying this it tells us you're enjoying it and it tells our guests that you valued what they've shared with us they've made time to talk to us so it'd be hugely hugely helpful please hit like please subscribe 
and please share with your friends. So until next time, thank you so much for listening.